Okay. Um, so, uh, welcome everybody to the last session of the first day of Kubert Summit. Um, uh, by the way, all of these sessions are being recorded, and as soon as we can edit the video, we will get it up on um, the Kubert uh, YouTube uh, screen in case you missed anything. Um, but for our last session of the day, uh, we have Fan Zhang, uh, who's going to be talking about um, their real life experience with using uh, Kubert at NVIDIA. Um, so uh, take it away. Okay, thank you. Yeah, hi everyone. Yeah, thank you for joining my talk. My name is Fan Zhang. Uh, I'm a software engineer at NVIDIA. I'm working on de delivering a uh, global deployed uh, massive scale uh, GPU cloud services as a foundation for some challenging workloads like cloud gaming, AI, and machine learning, and uh, GPU accelerated workloads, something like that, uh, at a large scale. So today I'm going to talk about a few bugs and the findings from the VMI churn in our practice. Uh, 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 this is this is uh, agenda. So I will introduce the Kubert use cases at NVIDIA and talk about some interesting bugs and findings and some takeaways from our side. Oops. Okay, so uh, yeah, I, I would like to start with talking about how Kubert is used in NVIDIA project and something about our use case uh, that upstream doesn't uh, doesn't cover. So NVIDIA is leveraging Kubert as the core part to build cloud native infrastructure and services on the on-premises data center to support our globally multi-tenancy workloads like stream gaming. Um, we hope Kubert to in our stack to be resilient and resilient and reliable, and the workload on it to be managed in a pure cloud native approach. So now take the stream game and use case as an example. So stream games must be running on a window machine, window, window machine, Windows machine. The backend services must be running on Linux virtual machine. Uh, all our infrastructure services and are built on top of Kubernetes. So basically, all of them must be running isolated in a multi-tenancy environment. Uh, we have sort of complicated hardware devices that need to be supported. Uh, if uh, it includes, but not limited to a, a variety types of GPUs, PCIe devices. So, um, uh, so many know the resources needed to be uh, uh, to be advised and assigned to the VMI so dynamically. Most of our workloads are created in an on-demand manner. We expect our virtual machine lifecycle specifically uh, like start, pause, resume, and migration, for example. Um, we are focusing on the virtual machine instant object directly. The workload runs in a high intensive dynamic manner. VMs burst, uh, burst with creation and deletion every minute. Some workload lifetime normally would not exist more than two hours or even less. However, some critical services would expect it to be running uh, for a long time. Um, some, uh, so some uh, big QPS in the scale, uh, we expect burst creation rate at least uh, 600 VMs per minute. And uh, normally we are uh, running a big Kubernetes cluster with over 600 bare metal nodes and over 1,000 VMIs are running every minute. So that's uh, uh, our use case. So let's move to uh, the box. Okay, yeah. So, uh, the VM status stock. So first one is a VMI status stock issue. In our practice, we noticed a couple of times that the launcher pod was moved from Kubernetes cluster, but VMI uh, object, uh, uh, VMI instance are still in running status. 
So looked into the logs of the Kubernetes, uh, uh, the logs of the Kubernetes and Kubert. There, uh, we found that there are two issues happened. The first one, a word handler failed to sync. Uh, word handler failed to sync domain cache during a crash or termination. A rebooted word handler has to resync with the API server and rebuild the local informer cache. Uh, unlike VMI, which is persistent in FCD, the domain ca informer cache is completely lost during the word handler crash or termination. Word handler handles resync by listing launcher socket files in the host path and adding back to the domain informer. Then, uh, in the default working process, it calculates the uh, accurate VMI status based on the domain and VMI existence. If the pod is gone and the domain is unresponsive, the VMI should be firstly updated the field status by the word handler, and, the, and, and then the word controller can take over this VMI and for the af afterward finalizing and deleting. Kubernetes is a distributed system. So there might be multiple controllers running and trying to write to the same object simultaneously, or uh, object is manipulated concurrently. So Kubernetes API implemented, uh, implements multiple version concurrency control, MVCC, uh, to orchestrate the concurrency write operations. So uh, to update the resync the object, the controller must use the latest a resource version. Uh, and however, uh, in uh, we notice that the resource version is, of the VMI is easily get lost. So in the current code base, the word handler does not cover the situation when the resource version is uh, is empty. So the uh, I'm um, so in this issue, I'm I'm going to to add a fix to get the latest resource version to update the object in this case. And the, uh, add, adding the get permission for a word handler are back. Uh, otherwise, we can see there's um, uh, the, you know, the error messages like the resource version is, uh, is empty. Mm. Uh, another issue needed to be mentioned is, uh, is we noticed that able to mark VMI as unresponsive socket error messages in the word handler log. Um, this is because the, the pod volume directory on the host was deleted uh, when the pod was gone. Um, um, there are many reasons. Might be uh, um, this pod is evicted in the reboot of the node, uh, or the node not ready status lasted two uh, for last uh, more than five minutes. Uh, the pod will be evicted. Um, the periodically go routine uh, word handler has a periodically go routine checks the state uh, stale socket and marks the unresponsive one by creating a launch uh, a launcher unresponsive file at the same directory of the launcher socket. However, if the pod volume is completely removed on the host, there isn't a directory can be right to. So uh, we we always so uh, the stale uh, error messages always happens repeatedly. Mm. Yeah. So um, the reason for this, uh, we suspect that it might be relating to the ghost record the caching. The launcher socket pass was not cleaned up properly. Uh, that's why we go to the next issue. So this is a very interesting bug. We capture this when. When VMI stuck, uh, stuck in scheduled status, but the launcher pod failed with an error showing the compute, com the compute container was terminated. Whatever this VMI is recreated or re retried, the result was the same. So looking to the issues, I found this relating to the ghost record, which is not cleaned up properly, as I said. So uh, I'm uh, yeah uh, I'm talking a little bit about the ghost record as a background. So each new created word has a launcher pod needs to provide a launcher socket and register it into the var 
uh, run covert private uh, ghost records uh, via uh, UUID path for caching. As, uh, and every every time the vert launch restarted, it will read all the uh, file, uh, vert handler will restart it, it will read all the files in the path into its cache. The ghost record is used for guaranteeing that the VM's local data is cleaned up. While, v while vert handler reinitialized uh, even if the VM is deleted from the ATCD. Mm -hmm. How we debug this issue and found the root cause? Um, there are some clues. Uh, first, the issue happened after a node rebooted from a not ready situation. Uh, the word handler was terminated by the kubelet during the same period of the ready status. So that's the first clue. Uh, second one, uh, from the termina terminated computer log, we, we see it was timeout waiting for domain to be defined. Uh, and we find uh, from the uh, we, we, we found from the word handler logs we saw that the error message was something like um, unable to create a word, uh, word launcher client the records uh, when we try uh, uh, already exist with different UUID. Uh, this this sort of clues point me uh, upon me to think about if the uh, the word handler most likely used the wrong word launcher client to build the connection. So I look into the only one ghost record associated with this VM and found out the socket file pointed to a pod which didn't exist. Then I checked the word handler logs for this missing pod UID. And then I finally found out the pod of this UID belonged to one previous VMI of the same namespace and the VMF. So uh, back to check the, this VMI. Uh, this VMI is for critical services and uh, is asked to be deployed on one specific node. Also, the VM name and the namespace are specified. So it means the key of this host record is always the same. And the VM, VMI will always be scheduled on the same node. Okay, so checking back to see the timestamp, the word handler was terminated on the node, and the node was suffering from node not ready for more than five minutes. So the previous launcher pod was evicted, and the but the local data was not cleaned up properly. So word handler did not have to clean, uh, did not have the chance to go through a successful cleanup process. The ghost record was a stick around. After the word handler rebooted, every time a new VMI of the same key, the namespace uh, slash VMI name was uh, spawned, the, the word handler using the key, uh, uh, using this the same key, had to pick up the, the, the stale ghost record in the path. So the VMI will never be processed and the connection cannot be uh, build. Um, uh, that's why we saw the container uh, failed with the timeout waiting for the uh, connection. So looking into the code base, uh, I think the fix will be adding a cleanup logic for the ghost record. Uh, this could be done by extend, extending the logic of the cleanup when deleting the old domain existence. So um, th this is um, I think this one should be, um, this is a good example. We should be think about uh, some um, corner cases, especially when the failure happens on the Kubernetes components, uh, how we are handling the um, uh, stale uh, ghost record on all socket files. Okay, uh, yeah, okay, so, uh, the at NVIDIA, our workload could be very intensive and uh, at a large scale. So uh, we are experience, uh, experiencing uh, something that uh, hasn't been covered upstream. So today I'm going to talk about uh, um, one thing is at a large scale, for example, 1,000 uh, VMIs, uh, deleting a lot of uh, VMIs can cause the controller to panic. 
Um, before we explain the root cause, uh, let me step back a little bit and uh, look more abstract on how um, Kubernetes controller works and why they choose uh, the, uh, the event, uh, the event logic. Um, here are the two ways to detect the uh, state changes uh, for an event in Kubernetes in, in the real world. So one is an uh, event uh, edge trigger and uh, uh, or edge driven trigger. So at, um, which means at the point in time the state changes occurs, a handler is triggered. For example, the pod was in uh, there wasn't any pod. And suddenly a pod is running. Yeah, so, um, so this is edge trigger. Uh, it's not uh, like a pulse. Mm, the, the second one is a lever trigger. Lever triggers means the state is, when the state is checked at the regular, uh, the state is checked at the regular intervals. And if um, something or certain conditions uh, happens or met, uh, then the handle uh, the uh, the controller the trigger is a trigger. So lever trigger is a form of a porting. Um, if it does not it does not scale well with the number of objects, uh, the latency of the controllers uh, uh, noticing changes depends on the interval of the porting and how fast the VMI can uh, the the how fast the API server can answer it. So if many async controllers run simultaneously, the system will take longer time to meet the desired state status. So on the contrary, uh, edge triggers is much more efficient with many objects. Uh, the latency most depends on the number of worker threads in the controllers processing events. So Kubernetes, uh, using the Kubernetes controller is it designed based on uh, the, the edge trigger. So uh, also we call it event uh, processing. Um, yeah, let's, re let's refresh how um, what, uh, Kubernetes controller works. So Kubernetes controller has two main components, informer and work queue. Um, informers have a uh, mechanism on the hood to watch for changes on the current status of Kubernetes objects and uh, send events to the worker queue. Then the event in this worker queue will be popped up by the uh, workers to process. Inside the cache, there are three uh, callback functions, add function, update function, delete function, and they are called if the corresponding events happened. Uh, for example, uh, delete function is called when an existing resource is deleted. Uh, it gets the final state of the resource if it is known. Uh, otherwise, it will get an object of the uh, it get an object type uh, delete final state unknown. Uh, the, uh, this can be happen if the watch is closed and miss the deleted event and the controller doesn't notice the deletion until the uh, subsequent uh, release that happened. So actually, uh, we also uh, we also we observed that on the larger scale, edge trigger event like delete have a higher chance to get missed. When the watcher missed the delete, uh, the, when the controller uh, quivered missed the delete event happens, the delete final state on known object is added to the data FIFO queue of the VMI informer. So, but the quivered picks up the object and the casting uh, the attempt, attempt to assert the key uh, to the VMI, which is uh, causing a runtime panic. So that is the root cause. Uh, the, fi the fix is easy. We added this uh, search before a uh, uh, vert, uh, vert controller, every time vert controller trying to assert the, uh, the object's type. Okay, so, okay, so some takeaways. Um, <laughs> the, uh, in the, the chaos engineering is needed. It is a, a master tool to identify weakness in the system that could potentially lead to outages that harm customers before we ship in the product. So chaos engineering uh, experiments could help us to do so. 
or without many covert or VMI issues, uh, a sort of a religion has a sort of a relationship uh, to the pod crashes, not, not available uh, network and IO problems. So we're on the way to explore some fault injection solutions to covert. Uh, to do this, use writing some scripts to randomly uh, inject some uh, faults, but that's not uh, enough. Uh, we have uh, experience. Uh, we have uh, investigating some uh, chaos engineering tools like Chaos Mesh to do it. Uh, hopefully, we will have another talk on this. Um, second one is a scale covert gives up much value. Um, some issues are discovered in a large scale environment. So understanding the covert. And the learning how convert, uh, convert can move efficiently to use Kubernetes is very valuable uh, to the uh, industrial product. Uh, we, uh, my colleagues are running is giving us a skill set for some initiatives to improve Kubert at the large scale. Uh, we are very happy to share what we were found in our practice. Uh, the last one is debugging. Uh, debugging is, is hard and painful. Um, so there are many challenges, uh, as I, I can see. Uh, the first one, uh, some tricky problems are not easy to reproduce. This is a major blocker for debugging. Uh, second, um, bug could only be fired in some particular criteria, uh, but we don't know the root cause most of the time, so we cannot reproduce the debugging. Uh, it is also it is very hard to capture all the information needed to debug. For example, components log are not sufficient to debug why the QEMU uh, process terminated unexpectedly. We uh, needed to search for every piece of clue to find out the root cause. So yeah, so okay. Um, Okay, so that's all for my talk today. Uh, this is my contact information. So feel free to shoot me any message and talk about this. Yeah. Cool. Okay, awesome. If you want to stop sharing your screen, um, we'll see if we have any questions. So thank you very much for that. Um, the um, so, do folks have any questions, comments about uh, Fon's experience? Uh, Andre, you wanted to ask about live migration uh, with NVIDIA GPUs? Um, so, uh, in, uh, as far as if I remember correctly, NVIDIA GPU, um, um, because we are using the bare metal uh, virtualization platform that doesn't support the migration of the virtual uh, GPU. So that's not the case in our, uh, that's not the um, something we take care of in our platform. Uh, also in our use case, we uh, when we support the VMI, the VMI running uh, spin out very quickly, and the lifetime is very short. So there isn't a need to do the uh, do the migration. Okay, cool. Uh, Ashley wants to know what kind of monitoring and alerting you use. Uh, we use promises and a lot of uh, exporters to um, to grab the the information and logs from the cluster. And pointing to the dashboard, so that's a uh, that's a major tools we are using. Under wants to know if there's any way to monitor GPU temperature. Uh, the GPU temperature that's uh, that, that that's a uh, uh, Nvidia has a lot of tool. Uh, the Nvidia has a, a tool to monitor the GPU. It's uh, I think it's uh, uh, I forgot the name. <laughs> you can yeah, check it on the uh, Nvidia GPU online. Uh, 
Prashanth wants to know what VMI scale numbers could you scale to after fixing the panic issue um, on deleting the VMs? Uh, what VMI scale numbers um, I could scale to after fixing the panic issues? Or the, yeah, so uh, we, um, we are, we, uh, after we're fixing this problem, we can support uh, uh, over 1,000 VMIs currently running in the cluster. So every time there, um, uh, every every minute there are hundreds of VMs created and deleted. So this is there. Yeah. Yeah. So Chris is commenting that uh, NASA is actually using water cooling for their NVIDIA GPUs. Um, we need to answer that. Um, <laughs> and I guess, I guess, um, do you want to share your contact information slide again? Uh, sure. Um, just because uh, Andre wanted that. Okay, and you can get uh, contact information to ask other questions about NVIDIA or ask them on the Kubert dev list if this relates to Kubert, um, because that is the way place to discuss this sort of thing. So I want to say thank you for everybody for attending this first day of Kubert Summit. And thank you so much to all of our presenters um, for making it a great and information packed event. Um, we will have a second day of Kubert Summit tomorrow. Um, and remember that because of the platform we're using, you need to RSVP to the second day separately. Um, so if you haven't done that already, um, please go ahead and do that um, so that we can see you tomorrow morning, starting at 1400 UTC with an update on where we are in scale and performance. Um, so thanks everybody and see you tomorrow.